Thanks. Hi, so I'm Rhino Boyle. Um, as he said, I'm the product security manager at There we go. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Now hopefully you can hear me. I said really cool, funny stuff before, so sorry you missed it. Um, so anyway, my, my current role is that I, I manage product security at Vericode, where as a company, we look to find security issues, but the same thing internally for our own products. We try to find our own security issues and fix them. And one of, the, one of the ways we've done that is by building a security champions program over the past about four to five years. Um, so we started that process back in 2014 as a result of figuring out how we could even work within like an agile development cycle and uh, move at the speed that those teams were working. But we ran into this, this problem of how with a, an extremely limited, small group doing product security, in this case, it was less than one full-time person doing product security. It was just me part-time with uh, multiple development teams working on multiple products. And we had this, this issue of, of trying to scale and make sure that we could do product security um, at the scale we needed to and at the speed that the teams were working. So the, the natural risk there is that if the, if the development teams are that far ahead and moving that fast and security can't keep up, then security bugs are gonna happen, they're gonna get shipped, and we're gonna have to deal with, it, with all the possible outcomes there. So over time, in addition to investing in the right tools and the right processes to try to move at the speed of development, we also had to go after the scaling problem which we did by starting the Security Champions program. And the fundamental idea there was to, to build a partnership between product security and all of the various development teams so that we, we had kind of a win-win proposal of scaling it and speeding up the process for the teams. And so while I'm gonna talk a lot about what we did and sort of retroactively looking back at things we did that worked and things that didn't work, tried to distill it down into some steps that you can take to either build a program if you don't already have a Security Champions program, or if you do have one, uh, maybe you can adapt some of what we did to your program. Uh, and afterwards, I'd love to hear from anyone else out there who, who has feedback on what you're doing. And again, the, the point of that being, think about how you can apply this stuff to your business and your teams to ultimately ship better software. So what is a security champion? There's, there's different definitions out there. Some of them, um, some of them focus on, on having members of the team just interact with centralized security teams. That's also, if you see other types of like guilds in the, in the agile uh, sense, that's another one, like you know, at Vericode we also have a UX guild, and very much the focus of that is to have members from the team know how to follow the process that this shared team, the shared resource has defined, and that is part of it, but my definition is something that it's a little bit more than just that uh, interaction with the security team, but it's actually about having someone on that team who's responsible for 
making sure security is a part of everything that team does. The, the way I sometimes sum it up is that it's someone who's been identified, or a few people who've been identified, to be the security conscience of the team. So nowhere in there did I say that they're like an expert and that they know, you know they're a subject matter expert. They're not. They're there to at least make sure that someone's asking that question of, oh, did we account for the security of this story that we're working on? Oh, should we, should we pull in IT security or product security or whatever other group? But then over time, with that exposure, they will become more of a subject matter expert. And the, an important part of that too is that they're never a complete replacement for the fundamental, for the, for the centralized security teams that are gonna work with them. It's about enabling the teams and uh, giving them support from the security organization to, to be more um, self-sufficient as much as possible. To that end, our definition of a security champion also is, it includes the idea that they will be advocating for security in the processes and with the tools that the teams are already using. We don't go in and say, you must use this process. We'll set some guidelines and let them figure out how to adapt it into, into it. We do prefer that they use uh, Vericode for, for some purposes, but. <laughs> So if you're starting a program from scratch, one of the things that we, that, that we learned was there's some stuff you can do before you actually kick off the program to help ensure that you grow a successful program. The first one is talking to all of the groups that are gonna be involved. So security, development, and various types of management. Um, just some sense, how many, how many folks in the room, a show of hands, say you're primarily on like the security side of things? Okay, a lot of you, and how about development? Okay, anybody wanna call management? PMs or just general managers, yeah. Um, so from each of those three groups that are represented here, there's gonna be some commitments that you're gonna have to make for a program like this to succeed. So there's gonna be some, some things that you're going to have to adapt what you do to accommodate this type of an approach. So from security, the first thing is integration. You're gonna to have to accept that development teams are going to define processes and they're gonna select tools, not necessarily specifically security tools, but they're gonna to choose tools on how to manage their workload, they're gonna to choose tools on how to build their software, and security is gonna have to accept that those teams are gonna choose the way they wanna work, and different teams may also choose different methods and different tools, and security is gonna have to take on the, the process of figuring out how to integrate with all of those different components. And then second is implementation speed. Uh, the focus in development these days is completely on, on rapid, agile approaches, shipping things more frequently, not, not the old like annual release that a, that a lot of places were doing, but teams want to, to iterate quickly and work on the product they're building and release that and get that out to customers as quick as possible. And so the, some of the old uh, security approaches of doing one big review at the end uh, just continue to be un untenable as a way to work with modern teams. Uh, so this means, sometimes too, f that, that means for the security team, that means getting out of the way and, and finding the places where security really does need to be involved heavily and then finding out the other places where they can take on that supportive role and maybe hand off some of the responsibility to make sure things are, are happening, probably early in the development life cycle. You know, security may still need to be a gatekeeper if that's your current role before a release, but there's lots of stuff you can do early in the development process that someone like a security champion can take the, can take the lead on. Then second, development. So the, the first thing is development has to be all in on security, right? If we're talking about this, this shared partnership between these teams, 
and this collaboration and that security is going to do their best to only be involved when they need to and to move fast, um, development has to accept that there's, there's a handoff there and that they have to be responsible for security. They have to treat it the same way they would treat performance testing. They have to do security testing the same way they would do functional testing. It, it's, it's another type of quality of the product that they're going to ship and they have to take ownership for that. And then second, if you think of it as like compliance or standards, they have to also say not just, okay, we're gonna be on board with security and we're gonna take on some responsibility for security, but the bar doesn't change. If you still have corporate policies, if you still have standards, if you still have ways of, of um, setting that bar for what the security of your products need to be, the development team can't just go in and, and sort of say, oh no, we're not gonna hold ourselves to that standard. Um, and they, they still have to do, do the things and, and hold the product to the same standard that they would even without this type of program. And then finally, <clears throat> management. So both people managers as well as um, whoever's setting the, the, the roadmap for the products. There has to be buy-in from both of those groups as well because while the idea here is, is to have someone advocate for security in all the activities that are already happening, there is still gonna be some amount of overhead for that and some amount of, of uh, security training or participation in, in other projects. And there has to be a commitment around goals and about resourcing that you're gonna get the full support of those managers who come review time, you know, that they're not gonna penalize someone because they had to spend some of their time or not that they had to, but they chose to spend some of their time being involved in this type of a security program. And really those, those goals should be part of their, um, or th those security guild goals should be part of their personal goals. And also there should be a way to get alignment from the roadmap, however that's determined. But whatever planning happens for the products, there's going to be work that comes out of this that has to be done in those product lines. So from those three groups, if you, can, if you can have a conversation with all of them about what this type of program would be and what the ask is and how things will operate, then you can get agreement on those shared goals for the, for the people involved as well as for the products and what you're trying to achieve and get the commitment around uh, the, the, the people who will be involved. Another important thing that, that we did leading into starting this program was making sure that there was a security culture, not just within the security teams, but across all of development. So at a, at a place like Veracode, where we're focused on security all the time, we had some of that, but still day to day, a lot of people are focused on whatever that one thing they're working on is, and, and maybe they've heard about cross-site scripting and SQL injection because they inevitably hear about it all the time, but it doesn't mean they had a chance to actually dive into these security topics and learn more. So we set out to make sure that we were um, encouraging interest in security across all of the, all of the teams uh, through a couple of different things. One was um, we already had an existing culture of doing like lunch and learns where once a month someone would, would give a talk just in the cafeteria and people could bring their lunch or some, some months would be like, you know, pizza would be ordered for everyone. And, um, There'd be a talk, you know, one month about uh, something very like security focused, like crypto, and another month about Burning Man from someone who'd been out there a bunch of times to a whole talk about Helvetica and just free form anything that people had had some expertise on and wanted to share. And we made it a point that we had security representation in those as well to get the word out there about about this and, and to share some interesting interesting stories and topics in security. Second, uh, post-conference summaries. So anytime someone from like our research team or any of our other security groups went out to conferences, we would try to get a scheduled time for them to come back and recap some of what they saw that was the most you know, interesting content either to them or to the company and open that up just again, like open invitation to anyone within the development team, usually around lunchtime to make sure people could, could come check it out if they wanted to. Um, in particular, like in the summer after the run of like Black Hat B-Sides DEF CON, 
we would tend to have a lot of people who went out there either for work or on their own, and we would have a longer session and have people sign up for um, sign up for uh, one talk that they wanted to summarize, and then depending on how many, they'd get like two minutes to five minutes, and then provide pointers out to something else. And so again, it was just trying to trying to find ways to expose this interesting content and relevant content to the development teams. And then finally, one that that uh, we still do regularly every week was we started introducing capture the flag contests to the to the group. The timing of this was uh, such that the um, there was a hacky Easter sort of online challenge that was um, run by like Hacking Lab and. It had a really good mix of like puzzly sorts of things to more security relevant types of things. And it, and it was a great way to get some of the developers hooked on security that way because they would come in and they'd start off with some of the ones that were much more you know, classic crypto or puzzles like you might see in a newspaper and then inevitably get, get hooked and want to solve as many as possible. So we set up a weekly session where again, open to everybody who wanted to we scheduled it from like 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. to try to accommodate people who, you know, maybe maybe um, were tightly tied to their desk until five, but then they could still come for an hour, um, and just come work on these puzzles and and share notes across across everybody who was working on them. And uh, we had, you know, we had I think something like seven people solve all 24 puzzles because they got so hooked on it. And so we had those weekly meetings for that and we just kept it going. We kept that going and started uh, just providing them pointers to other things. Like there's a, lot, there's a lot of online CTFs out there, both event ones as well as um, sort of level-based ones. So like Over the Wire was one that we've used a lot and point people to to get started. Google's cross-site scripting game. Um, and we just, Still to this day, we now do it at lunchtime on Thursday, so I missed it today, but uh, the, the folks can just come in and if they wanna work on one of those sort of preset ones from our menu, they can. If they've been doing this for a while and they have other stuff, you know, we've had people work on like the Matasano uh, Crypto Palace challenges, we've had people work on sort of their own thing in that space, but just creating that environment gives them one, exposure if it's new, or two, a way to carve out and dedicate some time to continuing on and, and learning about this stuff if, they're, if they've already spent some time. But it was also a great way to, to start that conversation with a lot of development folks and find out who might be interested. So at this point, if, we've, if, if you've um, talked to those groups to, to get buy-in on building a program like this, You've done some stuff within the organization to try to get security out there as a topic. Now you're ready to start looking for who's gonna be that first batch of security champions in your organization. And hopefully at this point, you've already got some idea of who because the folks that are coming to the CTF sessions and, and coming every week and are really getting into it, they're probably a good candidate to, to foster that interest in security and uh, keep them involved. Same thing when you're out, when you're talking to the managers about building this type of program, they may have some, some great recommendations of, oh, you know who, who already kind of does this and, and does make sure, hold us to task to make sure that we're always talking about security is you know, th this particular person. So you may get some recommendations there from managers and, and get some ideas from those other activities. Then one of, the, um, one of the important points there though is ideally these are volunteers. You could go to managers and just say, hey, can you pick one? You know, pick, pick one or two people from your team and, and make them your security champion. Um, and that can work, especially if it's, if it's a team that doesn't have a lot of exposure to this and there isn't an obvious candidate. But I, I think you'll get better results if you can find people who are already interested in security and want, whether it's for the resume building benefit or just a genuine passion for security, there's people out there and those are gonna be the best uh, choices. Again, so like what are some of, the, some of the criteria for like how to choose who these people are in addition to finding out if they're, if they're interested? Um, a good security champion for accomplishing some of what we're talking about here of making, making sure the team takes ownership over 
some uh, processes and goals that might be defined by um, by a centralized security group is that you need someone who can influence the team. If you have someone who's too too junior on the team in in some way and and can't can't realistically advocate and get stuff done, then that's going to be a challenge for accomplishing anything through that role. Uh, as the as the type of ask you know becomes bigger, so you want to look for people who are trailblazers, like people who are looking at new technologies or looking at new processes and tools constantly and sort of setting, setting the stage for what the team is going to do. I used to say like, you know, so this is like the people who first started talking about Docker when uh, other people thought of that as like pants, not as like a, a container thing, right? And now there's, they're probably talking about something else that I haven't even heard about yet, but they're looking into it and they're, they're researching it and they're figuring out how to, how to bring it to the, what they're working on. Um, other characteristics could be just seniority. Maybe that that's what the team really um, they follow lead based on. That there's this one you know one person who's been working on this product forever, and uh, they really set the set the direction for it. Uh, so whatever whatever it is within each team that sets the way they work, you want someone who can influence within that. It could also be just based around skill set. Um, we don't limit this just to developers. Um, we do have teams where there's very formal roles between like a developer versus a QA tester versus a database engineer. And then we have other teams that are a little more DevOps style and Scrum style and more interchangeable. And we, we don't set limits on what your role is. In fact, I actually prefer to have the group built up of varying skill sets. So we've got folks that are expert developers and they know the, the tools that we use for development and the frameworks we use and the designs. But then we've also got people who are primarily testers and they know the way we do that. So there's security stories that involve both of those. So having experts across the group helps a lot. Same thing, if, you're, if, you wanna, if one of your goals is to really focus on like CI, CD pipeline security, well, it's gonna be really helpful if you've got someone in the security guild who has a great knowledge of the way you're doing CI, CD, and can help apply that to their projects and then share that across all of the teams. We also have some things that we try to specifically avoid. Uh, because we are, we try to minimize the impact to the team, but there is more responsibility that these security champions are taking on. So we try to avoid people that are already ramping up on something. So if it's someone new to the company, and they, they just came in and they're, you know, they're gonna be learning how the company works, learning what the product is they're working on, learning the way the team dynamic is, that's maybe not the best time to try to throw some security training and some, some extra responsibility on their plate. Um, again, if we get back to the idea of them being an influencer on the team, well, if they don't even understand the team yet, how well can they influence it? So for us, we, we have a 90-day uh, waiting period from the time someone joins the company or if they've just changed teams and they're getting up to speed on a new product line, we do the same thing. We ask them to wait for 90 days before volunteering to be a security champion. Um, the exception to that is if someone's already a security champion on one team and then they transfer to another team, they keep that role with them because a lot of what, they, what they've learned from the security perspective is still applicable and they're not ramping up on, on that, they're just ramping up on whatever their new team and their new product is. And then second, someone who's not gonna be overloaded with other responsibilities. Like obviously like the, the, what we're describing here is, is exactly the type of person that on a team, lots of people are going to want them to advocate for whatever they're trying to accomplish and they're gonna be naturally um, a fit for other roles as well. So we, we avoid having a security champion be someone who's already fulfilling a team role like a scrum master or if they're in a member of another guild that, that is, has similar asks within the organization, if they're, um, in addition to being a team member, if they're kind of like the team lead or even a people manager for the team, we try to avoid um, overloading them and asking them to handle this in addition to whatever other special roles they may be filling. 
so now you, you've talked to all the people and gotten buy-in from all these different groups that need to be involved. You found some security champions. Now you've got to actually start doing something. So it's a good idea to have a plan for, for what your initial asks of this group are, is going to be. So that's where this is something that I wish I had done the first time around. So define an onboarding process. We kind of did this on the fly at first and then realized eventually, like, oh, well, when we start introducing more security champions, how are we going to bring them up to speed with what we did with that first batch? So I'd recommend if you're starting from scratch, define sort of an onboarding process and a welcome to the security champions program before, it may sound obvious, but it wasn't to me at the time. So, um, so think about what, what's going to be the initial things you're going to ask them to do, because you're not, you're not necessarily going to be able to drop them in and ask them to start doing the same thing that if this is two years later, that initial batch, they may be focused on something that you can't ask the new, the new uh, volunteer to do right away. So for, for us, what that looks like now is we have a kickoff session where we introduce the program every time we've got like a small batch that's, that's joining and explain like, so here's what the program is, here's what some of the fundamental responsibilities are, and then we have some training for them. We have, we have them do e-learning training just to, to level set and make sure they've got a certain familiarity with uh, application security concepts and general security concepts. And we also encourage them to start attending the CTF exercises so that they can see stuff from both the offensive side and the defensive side, uh, and also hopefully get kind of excited from uh, and find that fun. Then you're going to have to think about what's, what are the initiatives that you're going to actually ask them to do for their team. And th this is an area where you probably, you probably have, as security folks, have some ideas of like, oh, here's this thing I wish I could get the development teams to do. We really need to be doing this, and it's not happening. So now the Security Champions program can be one of the, one of the tools at your disposal to try to accomplish that. So for us, an example early on was, was about the process. So we had defined a process for doing security code reviews within the Agile uh, timeframe where we are trying to do a peer review from security of, uh, of any story that was identified as having security impact during the sprint that the team was, was doing the initial work, not after. We wanted it to be part of, like their definition of done for a story was that if this needs a security review, it happens and any bugs are addressed, just like any other types of testing that they would be doing. So that's what we went after first was, um, this initial goal that was something we had a pain point for and we, we didn't have everyone following the process that we'd set, so that was our initial goal. Then, um, those sorts of process-oriented goals where it's about interacting with the team are something I think you can ask of any, any level of security champion. So as they first come in, you're not asking any, any particular security expertise from them, but over time you'll be able to develop them into what I call like a phase two uh, security champion where you can actually give them more responsibility. So as I said, phase one, for me, the fundamental question that security champions have to keep in mind here is when do we need security? So at this point, it is that definition that you, that you may see a lot, which is just about how do we follow the security process? How do we escalate to security during development when we need to? Um, what are the processes that we're supposed to be following? What are the tools we're supposed to be running? And the focus here is really about working with, whether you have one centralized product security team or you've got multiple security teams, uh, but it is about, about following the process and taking direction from the security group while they're getting up to speed on other aspects of security, like going through their training, et cetera. But the goal here is that focus on, um, on, on taking direction from the security teams and implementing it. Even at, so at this stage, things that we did, uh, we asked security champions to define for their products a set of grooming guidelines so they, they had a starting point that we gave them that covered like here's all different security controls 
and so to start off with, can you, can you write down like what are some past stories that you still have or upcoming stories in your backlog that have impact on one of these different controls? So if there's any sort of authentication or authorization or crypto, whatever, just, just identify which stories involve that. And then the next phase on that was, okay, now take a look at some of the past security findings you've had and write up some questions that would help the team identify would help your team identify for this particular product that there should have been a security review here and turn that into a questionnaire that anyone on the team can look at and, and know that security needs to get involved. Um, even at this point too, you'll, you'll find that surprises will happen. So at this point, we had security champions just sort of in this phase and uh, we found that they were a natural resource when it came to product security incident response. When these big vulnerabilities came out and impacted really common components, rather than us, you know, this was before the days of automated SEA, um, we had to figure out across our entire product line who's using a vulnerable version of SSL, who's, you know, who's using these things. And this became a natural group to ask those questions of. They knew their product lines, they knew the technology that was being used, and even if they didn't know off the top of their head what versions, they knew how to answer those questions better than anybody else in the organization. Uh, but during this phase, you are gonna find that they still need a lot of nurturing and they need a lot of direction and you can't just give them a lot of responsibility yet. But as they develop into what I call phase two, this is where, in my opinion, they're, they're really starting to bear fruit. The, um, this is, like the, this is the point where you can start to actually ask them to take a little bit more ownership. They should be comfortable with the processes and the tools, and they should be getting a lot of exposure to security concepts, and you're gonna find m new uses. So I mentioned before, one of our big things was uh, scaling the way we did secure code review in every development story that needed it. That was still, at this point, you know, we had one full-time person doing product security against 20, 25 teams of developers, still a, a tough scalability problem. So we looked at, okay, how can we bring the security champions up to the next level and help address that? So we put together some custom in-house training, a two-day classroom training for security champions to talk a little bit more in depth than an e-learning course would about security fundamentals. And then we talked about five specific controls that we wanted them to start incorporating into the peer review they were already doing. And so it wasn't like weird crypto stuff, it was basic stuff like data validation, encoding, parameterization, uh, logging, and error handling. So nothing really weird, things that they're dealing with every day, and we put them through some specific training on that, and then, at, and then gave them a set of exercises to work through and actually find some um, examples from past vulnerabilities in real products, gave them the chance to go through without a lot of context and go find issues relating to those five things. And if they were able to do all of that, we consider them now certified to do that level of code review and we refine the process to, um, to again, with that sort of grooming guideline approach, the teams can look and answer questions about this development story and say, Okay, does it impact one of these five controls? If so, okay, it needs a security champion peer review on it. If it impacts one of these other security controls that we enumerate, then in addition to a security champion review, it also still requires a product security review. So we were able to, to scale up and um, hand off a reasonable scoped amount of security work to the teams that had a champion go through the training and get to the level where they could show to us that, th that they can find these types of issues. And from here, over time, we'll be able to do more of that. We'll be able to find new topics that we can share with them. Uh, we'll be able to find new, uh, new initiatives that we can bring to them to uh, accomplish more. So. Uh, so we are at time. So I will be around for uh, questions off to the side here or outside. And also, in addition to questions, if anyone out there has a Security Champions program, I'd love to hear about what you're doing that, that we're not. So, thank you.